But anyway, I, I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Jeremy. I'll be the uh, your guide for the tour today. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned to some folks, uh, I am one of the tour guides here on the weekends. Uh, my primary job uh, is uh, the, the, as a tribal archaeologist with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Uh, then I work Monday through Friday. So uh, uh, I'd like to uh, first talk a little bit about the history of the post and then a little bit into the history of the park before we, uh, we step inside. So it was first established as an infantry post in 1872 with the, uh, the construction of the uh, Fort McKean up on the, on the bluff. Uh, that was named after Colonel McKean, who was slain at the uh, Battle of Pearl Harbor. And it was not uh, it was not uncommon to name some of these Western forts after Civil War personnel, including, of course, uh, Abraham for Abraham Lincoln. Now, the uh, uh, when they built Fort McKean, it was largely uh, to provide a garrison to provide protection for the railroad workers and the survey workers for the construction of the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad, which was extended from Minneapolis, Minnesota, up to Bismarck. Uh, but it had stalled out by the time it reached Bismarck for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first was uh, a financial crisis that had uh, uh, struck the country, uh, known as the Panic of 1873, and made many of the financiers go bankrupt. The second reason was probably a more important reason, uh, was that uh, technically everything west of the Missouri River was uh, unceded land. It was part of what was referred to as the Bear Sioux Reservation, and it was uh, um, uh, was uh, and was a reservation as part of the uh, Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868. So uh, construction uh, extension of that uh, that railroad beyond that point would have been a violation of that treaty. That did not, however, preclude the U.S. government from con conducting surveys for potential routes for the extension of that railroad. That, of course, led to increased tension. Uh, with the, uh, the uh, very powerful Lakota Nation, which they had uh, established a peace with with the Treaty of uh, Fort Laramie. Uh, but realizing that uh, increased tension and the increase in uh, homesteaders coming into the area, uh, especially with the uh, discovery of gold in the Black Hills, uh, necessitated the establishment of a cavalry post here, uh, which uh, began in 1873. Uh, and was, um, after it was completed, would be renamed uh, for the entire installation for Abraham Lincoln in honor of the fallen president. So the, the master bedroom, of course, this is where the general Mrs. Custer sleep. Uh, and it was also in this room, at least in the, uh, the first house uh, that was, before it was rebuilt, where the fire started uh, in, the, in this fireplace. And uh, the fire was actually very devastating for the couple, particularly Mrs. Custer, who lost some very personal items. The most uh, uh, prized item that she had was a wig that was made of a lock of hair of uh, the gentleman when he had cut his hair. Now, um, the Surprised that real porcelain. Keep the stove going all the time because you would keep that stove going all the time. Yeah, that probably yeah. would be. Yeah, that would be nice and toasty. Yeah, that would be nice and toasty. Do not cross. cross. Oh, look, there's this. You a... are in violation, buddy. It's not the first time. <laughs> Here. That doesn't apply.
Here we have yellow watermelon. Never seen it. it tastes just like regular watermelon. So Helen, is it really taste like yellow watermelon? It tastes like yellow watermelon, but it didn't taste like real water, red water, watermelon. <laughs> the Mandan are going to live in this area in eight or nine villages um, until about 1781, 1782, um, but we'll talk about that. Um, as we go throughout the village here, we'll talk about the construction of their villages, how they're farming, their trade networks, what life is like in one of these earth lodges, all of these things, some of their religious and ceremonial life. Um, but before we do that, does anyone wander across the bridge? Wander and wander. There's Chester. <laughs> you doing okay? Yeah. He lost half his blood. Bigger than I thought. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right about when you get through the door, that's when you kind of feel that little temperature drop there. Yeah. All right, so welcome everybody to what we, we simply call it the Council Lodge or sometimes Medicine Lodge. Um, this one by far is the biggest lodge every man and village would have had. This kind of serves as the Dan Dan's kind of community center in the village. This one was never occupied or lived in throughout the entire year. This was only used for uh, special ceremonies like the official ceremony or councils uh, between either the elders of the village or perhaps elders and chiefs from neighboring villages that come here. Um, so as such, this carried both a practical use and a spiritual one. Um, now earlier I think my coworker Casey told you guys that it was women who built church lodges. Um, there is an exception to the rule and that's going to be this one. Um, when, they're, when it came time to build a big lodge like this, the entire village would have helped pitched in to pitch in. Um, so for example, little kids, what they'd be doing to help build this, they'd be weaving together all of these big willow branches and sticks that we can see in between the logs. Um, now, as far as construction go, this, this kind of applies to the smaller ones as well, but uh, we have to think how they're constructing these. They don't have power tools. They don't have nails or anything like that. So these are all, all these trees would have been hacked by stone or even bone axes. Um, they would have been dragged up here from wherever they, where they, got, they got them. And we can see they would have carved the notches for these big branch uh, posts. And when it comes time to put the four main center posts in, uh, what they would do is they're gonna basically dig a hole first and then they're basically going to slide it into place and then they're going to have these rawhide ropes attached to the top and basically a big line of people hoisting this thing up while at the same time they're going to have these ones already fitted so it's basically going up all at the same time um, so once these four ones are up that's the first step you're going to have your outer ones all along here you're going to have all your leaders on the uh, ground level and the roof then your uh, willow branches, then you have your layer of river clay or dirt, that's what makes it nice and cool in here, and then a final thin layer of earth or sod. Um, there's always going to be a central hearth or fire pit in the lodge, right beneath the smoke hole, that's where all the smoke goes. Um, so yeah, that's the basic construction of one of these. Now, there is a little difference between the council lodge you guys are in now and what theirs would have been. Their council lodge was a slightly different shape. It kind of had more of a flat fronted face and a big um, D or uh, oval that kind of went in the back. Um, we decided to make it look like a regular round one because the Mandan people today wanted us to make sure that we were taking people in here 
they don't misunderstand the spiritual significance, so we kind of went with a compromise there. Um, and the same thing, when we rebuilt this, that normally would have um, involved uh, digging in the ground to put up all these supports, which would have potentially disturbed uh, burials here. So instead, that's why we have this concrete slab, so we weren't able, to, we weren't going to disturb anything underneath. Um, so that's why that's here, and that's why the other ones don't have a concrete, they just kind of have a dirt floor. Um, now as far as what else we're going to talk about here, I have a few Mandan stories I'd like to share. So one of them is going to be their creation story, every tribe seems to have one. Um, for the Mandan, uh, and this kind of represents the Earth Lodge we're actually in, they believe that they originally became, came from underground at one point. Uh, they believe they were under the Earth and then one day a big hole opened up to the surface with a big vine coming down. So one of their warriors just decided to volunteer, climb up this vine, see what's up there. So he saw everything that was on the surface, all the plentiful game, wildlife, um, all the resources. Um, comes back down, tells them, hey, it's pretty nice up there. It's, there's sunlight up there. We don't have to live in the dark anymore. So they thought this was a pretty good deal. Um, so the tribe or the people begin to climb up this vine to go up on the surface. Uh, however, at some point, it seems um, either a woman tried to climb up this vine and was pregnant uh, at the time. So the people say, no, 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 don't climb up the vine. You're, you're too heavy, apparently. Uh, she's like, no, 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 I'm fine, I'll get it. She gets about halfway up the vine, breaks, collapses, and the hole is forever sealed. Um, so from there, some people, a man didn't believe that when they died, their souls actually went back underground to meet the rest of the people. Um, now, for the man that went up there, they believed um, a chief called Good Fur Robe uh, eventually led them out onto the Great Plains uh, next to the Missouri and Heart River here. And they actually named the Heart River because they called it this area the heart or the center of the world. So hence the name of the river here. Um, something so small that you can just have a face like that. Here we are at yet another interpretive center for Lewis and Clark. Every state seems to have one. So, statue, another statue. More statues, it's just statues. Yes. 
Oh, we're at Fort Mandan, North Dakota. Here we are at the museum store. There's a painting here. I'm going. Lewis and Clark, North Dakota Interpretive Center. Nice way to display all the donations or the people that donated to make this interpretive center possible. Are you wandering Wanda on YouTube? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna look for you. No, don't. It's just home videos. It's just this. <laughs> at all times on guard duty uh, and then two men inside the sergeant of the guards they would switch after two hours except when it got very cold and then they'd switch after a half an hour uh, and it did get very cold they measured the temperature every single day and the coldest temperature they measured 43 degrees below zero fahrenheit and that's without wind chill uh, and uh some things that uh, you'll be able to see in the sergeant of the guards room uh, are uh, their shaving kit, uh, a bag of coffee. They did bring coffee along with them. Uh, to help keep morale up. Uh, as well uh, as the blunder bus, uh, which would have been mounted on one of their boats. That's the sergeant of the guards room. Uh, you'll see where the interpreters stay. Lewis and Clark needed translators uh, for all the various Indian tribes that they met. Uh, and a couple of those translators uh, were hired right out of the Mandan and Hidatsa villages. How many men? It's an eight, but some are all here. <laughs> oh, okay. goodness it's very firm bed and so i think they just agreed that he's one captain and a lot of uh, even when Clark is growing on Wednesday, day a lot of the times it's coffee That looks like the prime rib. Yeah, it looks like the prime rib. There, you know why the Palisades always have pointy logs? No, I do not. It's because of snow. Snow! 
that would make sense now. Flat, it would build up. It. it would melt and it would run down inside the pool and cause it to rot that. I did not know that. A lot of people think it's keep people from climbing over it, but that's not the reason. It's, it's reason because, it's because of snow. snow. That makes sense. That makes absolute sense. Thank you. Storerooms. They would have stored uh, some gunpowder in the sergeant of the guards room, as well as some in general storage in there. And then each man would have his own powder. Uh, as well as, um, you know, have hundreds of people Because that was going to be a daily necessity for these men. 
And so what he did was he hired a man in Philadelphia to construct this lead cylinder. Uh, these lead cylinders were then going to be hollowed out and filled with gunpowder. They then corked it and sealed it with wax. That way they were able to bury them and cache them along the Missouri as they made their way to the Pacific and then dig it up on their way back so there was a constant supply of gunpowder and lead. One of the things that this guy who invented them did was took it one step further and he made sure that however much powder fit into this lead canister equaled the amount of lead that encased it so that when they melted it down to create those musket balls, they had the exact ratio of powder to lead that would be needed to fire everything that came from the cylinder so they didn't have an excess of one or the other. And so it was all of this very detailed, meticulous planning that kind of made this ex expedition possible. Uh, when they left St. Louis, they had about 10,000 pounds of provisions with them. And as you guys saw, as you went through the fort, it kind of makes a little bit more sense when they had the entire blacksmithing shop with metal in the raw. They had 52 lead cylinders, which equaled about seven pounds, seven to 10 pounds per cylinder, depending on the size. They also had gunpowder and barrels. They had their food provisions. They had a lot of their uh, scientific and medical equipment with them, as well as specimen containers and jars. The three boats that they left with originally were packed full as much as they could to accommodate to these men. They did, however, have to make different, uh, uh, what's the word, like adjustments to the lifestyles of this location as well, which is where we get the creation of these capotes, which were gonna be made of the Hudson Bay blankets. Uh, French fashion, because you know, fashion rules all, that's the whole headwaters of the fur trade as well. Uh, had these, oh gosh, they were the, what's the name of it? Scarves? No, it's not a scarf, it's a waistband. What? Fashion, fashion. So, uh, it, well, and, and the thing about it was they weren't, they weren't just used for fashion, they were used for practical means as well, for back support, because these fur traders were carrying so many items that weighed more than they had. And you know, today we have those waist belts, that you, like compression belts that you can put on. That's like the very first version of a compression belt. And so it's kind of interesting to know that all of these items that they brought along on the expedition later on kind of move into different factions of history itself. Uh, they also commissioned a chef before they left to make this thing called portable soup. Portable soup was a condensed dehydrated version of soup and in theory all you had to do was reconstitute it and then serve it to your men and that's going to be the very first version of an MRE that's brought along in a military no. expedition. That's Did it taste good? Lunch <laughs> so how many clothes do I have to buy for the next soup oh dinner? <laughs> and then along with that, they also brought a sea biscuit, which was also a, a dehydrated biscuit, which in theory, all you have to do is reconstitute it, and you're supposed to be able to eat it. It was more like hard tacking rule, to be perfectly honest. And uh, as kind of we see through the expedition, they didn't really like it, and they ended up eating their horses instead because the horses just tasted a 10,000 times better than that horse was ever done. Uh, one of the really interesting facts that I kind of like to talk about is like the offshoots of the expedition, how it affected history as we went in uh, through it. And so this portable soup, since it was kind of the very first MRE brought along, brought along on a military expedition, we start to see this being uh, put into effect in different factions of the military. And by the time we get to the Philippines in the late 1800s, early 1900s, because we're kind of exploring the, the lifestyles of the Philippines and to see what it has to offer us economically as uh, a new country, uh, the Navy is stationed down there and they crack into some of their new MRE provisions that they're kind of starting to get a little bit crazier with what the items they bring with it. And about 65% of their platoon dies of botulism. And it was all kind of a cascading effect of this very first version of the MRE. Also, with this time period, we start to see a lot of different items being added into our foods. And so, of course, the FDA is going to be implemented into our, our natural order of things. And so it's all because of Lewis and Clark that we have the FDA today. <laughs> so I'll just talk uh, briefly on their uniform that they brought with them. They did bring their uniforms with them. Uh, they did not usually wear these. Most of the time they would have had linen work shirts, like this one, that they would wear while out rowing. Um, but they wore these at Indian councils when they needed to look fancy. 
The uniform itself came with a round hat. A lot of the men decorated their hats with fur, uh, sometimes for fashion, a lot of the times for warmth. Uh, and uh, uh, these uniforms uh, were nice, made of wool, would be completely gone by the end of the expedition. Um, especially after their winter stay at Fort Clatsa. These would uh, it rot away in the rain. Uh, but uh, uh, they did bring it along. The captains actually would have been a lot fancier than this. You might have seen them in the captain's quarters, uh, uh, which would have had largely the shoulder epaulet was the biggest denotion of rank. Uh, so this would be a private. Uh, a sergeant would have a red shoulder epaulet. And then a captain would have, if he was an infantry captain, a silver epaulet, or if he was an artillery captain, a gold epaulet. Um, and so that's, I think. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a tour to go on to. Thank, Thank you. One of, the, Thank you. One of the incredibly, I think, interesting parts of this expedition was when we started the preparation for it, it was still only about 1801, 1802, when Thomas Jefferson gets this idea for us to kind of become even more economically independent from the British. Of course, you know, we're still kind of coming off of the hills of that uh, Revolutionary War, and we're still trying to establish ourselves as a nation. Well, one of the issues that we run into when we're buying provisions for this expedition is about 65% of the items that we were buying were buying from the Hudson Bay Company, which is a British-run company. So, of course, there's going to be that uh, conflict of interest on our side where we're trying to usurp the Hudson Bay by figuring out what's in this region, but we're also funding them so we can do it. And so one of the things that's interesting is because we didn't have any actual permission to be over here, and I had mentioned that we had to uh, kind of fund this expedition entirely on credit, captaincy was also going to be an issue that we ran into. When they brought Clark in for the expedition, he was only a lieutenant. However, uh, he was promised a captaincy. Congress, much like it does today, still had to sign off on any raise in rank in the military. And so it was after we get that Louisiana territory, we move into the idea of this uh, expedition being able to kind of go through, that we have to be true to our word and move Clark up to a captain. Well, we went to the one place where all things uh, in history kind of stem from, which is going to be Harpers Ferry. And we purchased artillery captain's uniforms for Clark and surplus from the Harpers Ferry unit. And so that is why those uniforms are different. Up at the center we have a button, bless you, uh, from an artillery captain's uniform that we found at a dig site across the river. And that is going to be the only documented artillery captain in this region happened to be William Clark, and so that is what we are able to suggest is from his uniform. So it's kind of neat to know. Uh, since we are kind of running close to that end of the tour time, is there any aspect of this expedition that any of you guys had a question on in terms of preparation or just the expedition itself that you guys weren't able to ask or have answered? No? I mean, I feel like you guys have been on the trail for quite some time. You must be experts at this by this point. So. <laughs> Hopefully, I can still learn every day. Did anybody get scurvy on the, on the uh, trip? Not so much. Scurvy is kind of one of those, uh, didn't really have to encounter it, especially since they were able to get that fresh produce from a lot of the tribes as they went across. Because not only were the Mandan and Hidatsa very agriculturally, agriculturally known, there were tribes that they encountered along the um, path that also had different forms of crops. Uh, it's interesting to note that their bowels, however, were not able to accommodate for a lot of the food that they were given. So um, like camas root, which is one of the ones that they were introduced by the Nez Perce, was a bit of a shock to their system because not only were they coming off of weeks of uh, very uh, small rations of food, they were also being introduced to a new food source. And so that was kind of a shock to their system. So it was more uh, like digestive issues that they had problems with. And so of course that cure-all was going to be those Dr. Rush's thunderclappers because they were just the cure for everything cure all of your digestive ailments, but it's interesting because they were tied heavily into laxatives as well as mercury, which was used as their binding agent. Oh, so there were a lot of issues that came along with that. Um, yeah, you have curious, over at Fort Lincoln, yeah. a lot of the cavalry or whatever died from scurvy, so why did they not have? You know, I'm not quite sure. It was so close. The, it was so close, but it's also a different time period for Fort yeah. Lincoln. They were later on. And so I don't know if um, maybe...
<laughs> Restrooms are more important. Yes, I know. <laughs> We are at spot 45. It's a windy day, sorry about that. I'll show you the RV site. I we are at the Bismarck KOA. And the site is a back in. The KOA employees helped me back in. So we've got water, which is up here. So this is a 25 cord and I got this from Airstream Airstream Life the cord has been very good it hasn't kinked it's not leaking so I do recommend it I'll put a link down below so water is at the front the sewer is in the middle which is a good thing and the electrical is a bit off <laughs> So we're there, and that is a 25 foot cord also. So everything is barely fitting in. We did have to put one block down. We have 50 amps, which is nice. And we kind of back into shrubbery. Okay, we'll walk around the RV site later. I am in the middle of doing laundry right now. So, we'll walk around in a bit. Oh, and yes, I would stay here again. Okay, you're more uh, yeah <laughs> I just put them out this is wild it's just windy but there's no rain this is this is my balcony in a windy what they call it a nice pleasant wind uh -huh. this is my balcony really I mean, <laughs> it's like I'm the used thing to this scares me is the freaking trees well you're not yeah. surrounded by I'm surrounded by them they're just falling off no, and that's, yeah I mean it's just these couple big ones here I mean, they put their slides in over there, and I don't know why. Oh. Not on that one, but the one that's right, oh. right there. I noticed I watched them pull their slides. I just in. noticed you've got an entire wall. With the slide, yeah. <gasps> Have you, you, never, you want to scoop inside? That's a slide. Here. My dogs are not, in. None of these puny little slide things. Well, <laughs> some of them have. Uh, the one on the end, John has. Well, I don't want to go in if Harold's not decent. I think he's in there. He's in, in a meeting. Oh, he's in a meeting. He's in a meeting. Let me just shut this one door. You're in a meeting. 
Oh, you have two snow whites. Okay, this is Harold and Vicky's rig. <laughs> well, and see, we cover this. We cover this because the front is so it's hot. So we. Oh put my God! Look at this freaking wall. Yeah. It's a bowling alley. It's a bowling alley. <laughs> so yeah, so we cover that up because the heat from out front, because that's our cab, but that gets really hot back in there. You know so. what? How do you drive with the air conditioning in the cab? Do you have to air condition the whole thing? No, the cab it keeps you good enough. It keeps you really cool. But okay. also, if we want to, the generator we can kick it on. We can run it and have the air conditioner on that way. Okay, we're we're doing an RV tour. <laughs> I should have cleaned. <laughs> This is how they really live. This is really how we live. <laughs> we'll be editing this. Okay, good, good. Oh, that's adorable. That oh, that's it. Okay, that stays on. Oh, that's cute. It's a watercolor, but it's on a, a metal watercolor. I just bought one of these. It's the best. It's so good. <laughs> I was a wall. I was like, oh, it's a top. Yeah. I've never seen this. Yeah, that's I how bought I, one. I get them on Amazon. <laughs> So, this is great. Oh, I miss having a large TV. Yeah. Yeah, and see, cool. normally there'd be a couch there, but we often were like, well, it's only us. Why do we care if it's a couch that people could sleep on? So those are recliners. Oh, good Makes idea. It nice. Makes it nice. And then you see, there's the bunk beds, because we have bunk beds. Oh, hello, girls. <laughs> You're so well behaved. This yeah. is a great idea. Yeah. So it's like... So, and then <laughs> my laundry drying, our bathroom. This is so cushy. That's for the dogs when they jump out because oh. it's so slippery. Oh, shoot, I want one. <laughs> I think those are like kitchen mats, the kitchen, you know, to put in front of your kitchen. And then this is, the, Harold tiled this. That's a good, oh my goodness, wow, that's a good tile job. But he tiled that and then we painted the wall. Oh. You know, instead of instead of this, this, uh, we went ahead and just did one accent wall. That's a good idea. I'm thinking of doing that too. Yeah. It did you just paint over the, the wall? Yeah, the yeah. we sanded it just a little bit, but we I just went over it. And on the edge, because I think they used some kind of caulk, so it kind of beat it off uh -huh. of that. So then I had to sand it a little bit better. I've done the same paint. thing to ours. Yeah. Well, like, why do I have so many fuzzy things? Thing. They're like, what's, what's that, that fuzzy is? thing in your ceiling? And then they're, Oh, I know oh, what it is. Oh, I don't want to disturb this meeting. He's in a meeting. Oh, you do have a king bed. Yeah. Why are you all wet? Why is he all wet? New Orleans. Oh, Jazz what? Someone just. 110%. And then he can spray it himself. That fan oh. is a sprayer. <laughs> okay, so those are the kids. Yeah, that's, that's the oldest is one wedding, and then that's our youngest one that works Disney. And then that's Harold and I at on um, in um, Nash Nashville, Asheville. Oh. Poor wilderness. I the next next two years. Nope. I just made reservations for August. Two 1st. years. I'm gonna call you. Yeah. Oh, now he's now he's showing us the closet. Now showing my closet. <laughs> Vicky's. Vicky's. Okay, that's all Vicky's. And this is Harold. And this is Harold's, which is. A quarter. <laughs> no, no. I have a drawers. He has the drawers, and I have no drawers. So this I had is to... a collective drawer. That's a collective. Oh, okay. Drawer. But I put drawers there. So. <laughs> That's our dirty clothes. Too. Oh, my! Our dirty clothes go in the truck. Oh, oh, that's a good idea. I love this one wall thing. Isn't that cool? Yes. And now over there, they over at Helen's, they did that and they turned it into a whole wine rack. I can believe that. You know, like, he has okay, all edit, edit, edit. <laughs> his boxes of wine and then he has a wine cooler in there and everything. I said, no, I need it for the dogs. So I love the one wall thing. Yeah, well, but, well that's what, this comes, this whole thing comes in. But so you can it, still get in oh, yeah, there. Really, it like, when this comes closed. Can you open the refrigerator? Oh yeah, yeah, it kind of, when I open the refrigerator, it's like, you know I what? At least you could still open it. I've seen yeah. some where you can. Yeah, and then you, if this comes in, it's like, because this one comes in, and for, so here it's. So like, you still have an aisle to get yeah, in. Yeah, I can still, I can still walk through here because that kitchen table. Well, that's how we walk in the airstream, anyway. Yeah. Oh, well, at least Walter does. <laughs> and that's why I, this was like. See, our old one didn't open up both see, sides. I like how open this. This yeah. is. Is this a 
super seat? This is a super seat. It's 39 and a half foot. It's a super seat. You know, so. I like this better than an A. So do I. So do we. Because that's also, it's when our kids come, that opens up to a queen bed. See, that's just, this is, yeah. I was, was going to take it down anyways, but see, this was, see, that's No, bed. you don't have to take it down. No, I've got, this is, because it's cool enough now. Take it down. But that, so that opens up, that okay. flips open. Is he in a meeting? What? He's in a meeting, I don't want to be Oh, he doesn't even know, he's, he's got, he'll turn it on and off. But that, so that, that comes down, it's a bed up there, so when they're up there, and then they just close the curtain. Yeah. So they're not in the middle of the room. Like, they can sleep up there, do whatever they want up there. So. Yeah. I like this better than those. Body into it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. You're welcome. I'm going to go up. Oh.